Um, okay, so we've just introduced ourselves. Kia ora, Tara, Sean, Nikki, uh, both co-presidents here of the National Disabled Students Association, and also Nikki is the president of the Waikato Disabled Students Association, which is very cool. Um, you have to be here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, let's begin. So we were established in 2021. Um, during slash after the uh, pandemic, because we were seeing a lot of disabled students being able to um, utilize hybrid learning and also the inaccessibility of university. Um, this was joined with the VIC Disability Association and other members around the Motu who um, helped come together and create this national association, which would have more power um, to be able to advocate to our ministry our ministers and ministers <coughs> with different providers. So, um, as I said, we were founded in 2021, and our membership includes the Victoria University Disabled Students Association, Otago University Disabled Students Association, University of Canterbury Disabled Students Association, University of Waikato Disabled Students Association, AUT, Massey, Wellcheck, uh, Unitech, and Open, Open Polytechnic. So we advocate for a barrier-free, accessible, and equitable tertiary education system. Um, we do this by hosting meetings with members and open meetings to hear issues of facing disabled students. Uh, we then support disabled students with issues they are having at the institutional uh, level and then lobby for greater support for tertiary learners from government. And how do we do this? So yeah, we host member uh, meetings. Uh, this is every month with our member associations around the Motu, so around the country, around the land. Um, and then we support disabled students with issues they're having at the institutional levels. So if you look on our website, we have a little contact uh, section where we get flooded with how to questions and support at the start of the year and even throughout the year where we support on a case by case basis and do a lot of advocacy. Um, for that more intimate level, uh, depending on what they're dealing with. Um, and then we lobby for greater support for tertiary learners from government and study land. And another one to highlight is we partner with the other student associations at national levels alongside our you know, member associations. We do this with NZISA, which is the International Students Association um, in New Zealand, and then the New Zealand Union of Students Association, which was actually established in 19, uh, 1928, so they're almost 100 years old, which is quite cool. And then the Timana Aokonga, which is the Māori uh, Students Association, and the Tumaki. Um, which is very cool to see that intersectionality between us. And then some of our partners, so we partner with Tipukinga, so we have contracts with them to look at the Learner Voice uh, network that we do. We partner with the Ministry for Education, um, which is the governmental ministry looking at, you know, early learning all the way through to higher education. Um, from there, we do all sorts of different projects with them on collecting data. Um, we do Achieve, which is very cool. They're a great network to connect with our disabled people in New Zealand, um, Universities of New Zealand, and yeah. And some of our other partners, uh, so the New Zealand Qualifications Authority, so the New Zealand Qualifications Authority um, is the regulator for the Code of Pastoral Care, which we mentioned um, uh, earlier in our official session for those of you who would have been there. So um, we we'll touch on more on what that policy is, but to foreshadow that largely looks at the responsibilities of uh, institutes and providers um, in terms of the care and well-being of students. Uh, we two partner with the Civil Persons Assembly, so this is a uh, a non-partisan kind of disability um, organisation that yeah, exists and uh, two lobbies for government but just not with our tertiary education um, specific lens and the Academic Qualification and Quality Agency too. So another one of our recent partnerships was with the Green Party. So the Green Party uh, did an inquiry into student wellbeing. This was a really encouraging um, uh, investigation uh, largely because 25% of the respondents were disabled, and so that reflects the disability data that we can. And the microphone's gone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. 
Uh, yeah, so that reflects the disability data that we um, have. So the disabled perspective is really carried through that um, in terms of the aquarium this is being used um, politically to really for greater support for disabled students and students more broadly. We also did a Why I Must I Miss Class campaign. And so this campaign was to uh, throw out the uh, rhetoric and the stigma that students are missing class because they're lazy, because they're apathetic. And that the reality is, is that students are missing class because there's inaccessible learning for disabled students, that it's not culturally competent for di uh, diverse learners, that there's a one size fits all for education. Um, and this is actually a medieval way of looking at education. And with today's cost of um, uh, cost of living, there's uh, students are balancing work as well as balancing cultural needs as well as balancing study. And so to reduce missing class down to uh, being apathetic or disengaged is to miss the whole picture here. And so we look to destigmatize that and tell the experience of disabled students and the fact that many of them are balancing work, they're balancing medical needs um, and balancing an inaccessible education. So for on voice, nothing about us without us. So the disability rights um, uh, mantra from the disability rights movements in the 1980s. So students, especially disabled students, are typically spoken about as opposed to listened to. The student movement is trying to move this to a place of genuine partnership where learners are at the center of all decision making. <coughs> so students and quality uh, student voice. So this can look in, like, uh, this can happen for a lot of different mediums. There's opportunities for engagement where students can have an opinion in the higher education authority, for example. The students' engagement, investing time in areas relevant to the support of the student experience and institution reputation. The student partnership, and this is what we're pushing for. This is working with students in various parts and stages of the quality process. And you can see a diagram there, exemplifying the different ways that students can be engaged. So what is this like in different regions? So in Africa, there's working with um, PAQAF, establishing the African Students um, QA network and building a pool of student experts for QA recruitment and training. In Europe, there's a pool of student experts from QA from 73 EHEA countries, representing in IEP steering committees, <coughs> EQAF, along that with student advice. And then in the Asia Pacific region, um, which we're here, here representing, there's inconsistent student engagement. The students on committees and boards um, at the national level, and we're still working to define what quality looks like. So looking at specific countries now, in uh, Scotland, for uh, the framework on, on quality student voice, there's a student engagement framework. In Wales, there's pathways, there's pathways for partnerships toolkit. In Ireland, there's advancing student engagement and decision making. In England, there's a framework for student engagement through partnership. In Europe, there's standards and guidelines for quality assurance in Europe um, education's area. And Australia is creating a national framework for student partnerships in universities, decision making, and governments. In New Zealand, we have Video Lapo, and this is progressing from student voice to partnership. So we're curious to hear from the uh, audience. So what is the requirement for student voice at your institute? Um, so if you bear with us, technology um, providing, we've got that all interactive thing. <laughs> So if you scan that bar, if you scan the barcode um, and answer the question, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Like a song dance, like a gesture to, you know, make this go easier and start singing. You could, you could do an interpretation of responses. Yeah, I could. <laughs> it's always a way that you you have things planned out. Oh, cool. I love this. Um, <laughs> you have things planned out on how the presentation is going to go, and then technology shows up and does what it does. I don't think there is one. Oh, big discussion. 
<laughs> no, but this would be, this is the sort of, okay, I'm going to. Cool, I love this because I'm, I'm not able to speak very loudly usually. This is, this would be a great way for us to interact with each other and help each other work on how we create requirements for student voice at institutions in Australasia. So later on we'll be talking about like the DAP discuss that and how that works <coughs> within your frameworks. So a lot of responses there, so a couple of them, uh, fortunately, they're not being one at the UQ students in the Senate formalised programmes to facilitate student reps on board and the committee to uplifting student voice. But one rep um, for a diverse group who speaks about everyone in that group, um, and I won't go um, through all of them reading because you're all just as capable as I, but the point being that there is a huge diversity um, of experience across there between different institutes, and there's a lot of learning that can be made available there, and something that came out in our student fishbowl is that power of being able to look to best practice, look to where there is strong student voice within institutes and ask the question as to why this isn't happening in our institute and build on the best practice of various different institutes. And two, you can see here reflected um, what the global context shows and that's that student voice and partnership is something that is still being understood in the Pacific region. And we can look to overseas to see where it's been more formalized and there are stronger policy tools. Cool. Um, and now I'm uh, looking at student voice um, in a more formalized sense in terms of institutions at the global union level. Um, we've got a list of the various different organizations you've uh, got there. So the INQA, AHE, um, which is currently being negotiated. You've got UNESCO, which has a high level steering um, committee, leaders group and Sherpa groups, and the IAU conference and working groups. And you can see to our right there an image of students working. At the regional level, you've got PACREF, the Conference of Pacific Education Ministers, and APQN, which is still under. At the national level in New Zealand, so we've got AQA, we've got student auditors on the AQA board. We've got the Tertiary Education Commission, which has a learner and student advisory council. We have the UNZ, um, or CASPAC, Tipukanga Learner Advisory Council, or Learner Network, and we have the New Zealand Qualifications Authority of Quality and quality assurance advisory group. So different ways that student voice is being embedded at a national level for our government currently. So this is Fidianalo. This is what um, we're pushing through as student leaders um, with, our, um, with our, our national union and with uh, the national student uh, movement, which has different components, which you can see um, up here. Um, so we have Whakafanongatanga, which is all about building connections with each other. We have Akaranga, which is learning with, um, with and from each other, and Mahitahi working together, and this being all about uh, progressing from consultation to genuine uh, to genuine partnership. Just saying this is blocking. <laughs> and uh, to Fakabat uh, Kali, which is strengthening student voices, which is what we're mounting to cumulatively here. So what tools do we use at the National Disabled Students Association? Um, so we've got the um, uh, Astral Care of Tertiary Education of International Learners, and uh, you can see that outcome one, the priority being given there, and that's on learner wellbeing and a safety system. Um, we then have learner <coughs> voices, outcome two, outcome three, safe, inclusive, supportive, and accessible physical and digital learning environments, like, so pivotal for disabled students and something that we can lean on when we see our institutes are not um, up to par. Outcome four, that learners are safe and well, and outcome five, positive, supportive, and inclusive environment in student accommodation. So uh, the National Disabled Students Association was involved in the design of this um, uh, policy, and we kind of paralleled it as saying like best practice, it was very positive um, experience for our leaders and for leaders across the multi across the country in New Zealand. Um, and so what were the strengths? It was that input through to output that we found that was so um, uh, empowering for our students. So there was monthly meetings with student leaders of whom were able to see the policy being transformed with that input. So there was that level of follow-through in the co-design. 
students were being remunerated as, as, as experts. We, as I pointed out earlier, students are time poor. Um, the, the framework for education um, is not in tune with the contemporary environment and experience of students. And so to not remunerate students is to actually just reduce the quality of the outcome that you're going to get from any kind of policy. And the big one too was that teachers and students were united you know, in arms and arms there because the reality is, is that many, um, many teachers, many lecturers are, are struggling with the same issues that uh, students are, just the institutional framing puts students against, um, uh, against teachers. I mean, look at accessibility for one. It's quite a lot for a, a lecturer to be able to adapt to uh, an accessible standard. It takes a lot of learning and you have some very passionate individuals within the sector, which is fantastic. Um, but what we need is the that best practice from individuals to be moved to that policy level. So when we're united with our um, lecturers, with our teachers, um, then we can overcome that burden that's being put on individuals. But to have weaknesses, as it's naturally going to, um, we're uh, not, we haven't found a utopia for co-designers of yet. Um, and when not uh, for Leonardo, it isn't being completely embodied. And so what we did see was a lack of um, student basis on the ground. So what it's lacking is, is we're here as student leaders, but we can't represent every single experience. So what we need to be is that vessel to be able to connect with students on the ground as a trusted um, source, um, to be able to collate all of those experiences. And so that they can hold us to account. And then two, we can hold governments to ins and institutions uh, to account. Um, if a two was rushed, uh, the, the context for the code, um, is yeah, it's slightly tumultuous, and it's so something I won't bring up here. You're quite welcome to um, <laughs> to to explore that, which does uh, illustrate the rust and nature of it. But two is quite reflective of institutes, it's quite, quite reflective of government, which really increases the emphasis for including students as soon as you can at the start. That happens with partnership. It means students are in the room when you're forming a policy, and that it's not it isn't that difficulty, it isn't that resource component to be able to have co-design in the first place because students are already there with you on and arms. And we had an issue with international student framing. So uh, this, again, a partnership issue. If you have international students in the room, then you're not going to miss that component of diversity for the policy you're trying to create. So another tool we have is the Kariuti Toolkit. Uh, so the Kariuti Toolkit is the New Zealand Code of Practice. It's designed to achieve um, an inclusive and equitable tertiary learning environment for disabled learners to succeed. <coughs> And so I'll now hand it over to um, uh, Nikki to explain a bit more about the Disability Action Plan. So the QLET Toolkit has been embedded in the Disability Action Plan, and Nikki's going to explain more on that. Sorry about that, I also managed to fumble the microphone. Um, so I'm here kind of just to talk a little bit more about the Disability Action Plan as some of these people involved in it. So quite simply, the Disability Action Plan is a strategy plan that is created by universities as well as other tertiary institutions in order to alter practices, procedures, systems, stereotypes that could lead to the discrimination of disabled students. Because what we were consistently seeing, and I'll be able to touch on this a little bit more later using my university as an example, is that disabled students were suffering in their educational experiences, they are less likely to graduate, they are less likely to have support, and we know that on a holistic basis that makes everything much worse. Um, it is, and you know, just touched on, it's used to improve outcomes for disabled students as they experience tertiary education, not just academically, but connecting with social groups on campus, connecting with um, pastoral care on campus as well. So the Tertiary Education Commission actually created a guideline for institutions to follow when creating their DAPs. So every institution has to have very clear use of the Kiality Tech Toolkit. They have to have set goals and show that they're actually meeting set goals. For example, um, making things more accessible for multi disabled students. Um, <coughs> correct use of language when addressing um, disabled students, what a reasonable accommodation is and how they're meeting those goals, how to make physical access less of a barrier, um, et cetera, et cetera, and who is responsible for that. So, you know, as a, as a student rep, I would be responsible for helping to relay things to accessibility services and to the vice chancellor, for example. Um, and that policies are clearly communicated, not just to those sitting on the plan, but to students themselves. So there are many, many benefits for having a DAP. So they ensure for, you know, 
monetary reasons, that tertiary institutions meet requirements to receive funding. So thankfully, um, whether or not you meet the DAP can affect how much funding you get. And as we know, money makes the world go around. So uh, makes it a little bit more incentivized to follow said plan. It highlights to the public as well that uh, not only is said institution adapted and accommodating to disabled individuals, but everyone in their fano or family and their circles, including family members, uh, carers, I'm lucky that I have my partner as my support person, for an example, uh, friends, doctors, everything like that. Uh, tertiary institutions then get a larger group of students because, you know, getting referred to and it's seen nice in the public eye and media. And it reduces the amount of complaints and the level of discrimination towards disabled students as well as disabled staff because a lot of these DAPs will also show how to better support disabled staff with meeting their needs in order to educate students. And, I mean, it helps their reputation too, which a lot of them could have helped with. <laughs> so how they created, I'm going to use my university as an example. This thing moves around a lot. Um, I'm going to use my university as an example because I'm aware of the other universities having plans that I'm intrinsically involved. So the Disability Action Plan uses focus groups to gather student voice, uh, whether that was on Zoom, whether that was meeting students in person, using surveys, my university used all three. Uh, on the different aspects of the institution and the educational experiences of students. So we're talking about how they consume their lectures and course materials, how they can access things online, how other students <coughs> perceive and support their disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as I touched on, surveys have been used to get student voice and understand the experiences in more detail, especially for those who couldn't um, as we may say in the disability circle, have the spoons to go and attend some of these focus groups. Uh, we then also have steering groups to finalise strategies and plans. So then we get all this information. We sit together as a group of staff and students uh, and we sit and go, okay, this is clearly a priority. This needs to be worked on. For example, the physical access of these buildings need to be worked on. The elevators need to be more accessible that sort of thing. And we finalize it all to send it off to the Tertiary Education Commission. And then that comes to the implementation groups. So then we make sure that the policies that were written out and agreed upon with the Tertiary Edu Education Commission are then followed through. This group is also made of uh, disabled staff as well as disabled students. And for our group in particular, there is two co-chairs and one being me, a disabled student, and another being a staff member. Um, do you mind touch a little bit on this? My brain's not brain. Sure. Uh, so uh, in terms of thinking about the disability action plans, um, uh, this is a quote from uh, a disability service manager at one of our tertiary um, institutions, which really highlights the nature of the disability action plans <laughs> um, to look to embed disability support and service all the way throughout uh, our tertiary education um, institutes. So we have a human-centered approach in that we treat the students as the experts in their disability. And they contribute actively to our focus groups or to our testing of our, our buildings. And I think that's really, really important that we acknowledge them and what they have to contribute in terms of their lived experience. So remunerating disabled students as experts to be able to transform a system which wasn't built for them, but with increasing uh, disability empowerment and dignity, disabled students shaping an education that's accessible, inclusive, and dignity fulfilling, all that. Um, so, how that looks like at a local union level. So, we have self review cycles, we have student panels, uh, including like student unions, we have academic boards or senates, um, we have member faculty, academic committees, working groups, and class representatives. Um, so each course and each paper will have a representative. So the plans in action, again, I'm using the White University of Waikato as an example. So part of the disability action plan was actually based off of the results of my research into access and inclusion at the institutions. So in 2021, I was 
lucky enough to be a student scholar uh, conducting research into the access and inclusion of disabled students at the University of Waikato, focusing on all aspects. So um, physical access, online access, accessing um, medical care on campus, uh, experience with uh, bullying and from staff members as well as other students and what we could then do to better improve the experiences of disabled students and my university based the plan off of the data that was there as well as touched on before the steering groups in the survey. Um, they gathered, gathered student voice directly from Disabled Students Association, so WIDSA as we lovingly call ourselves, and we had representatives from the DSA on the steering groups. We had me and we had a, another student called Jessica, and the implementation group has another disabled student as well, as their co-chair, hi. Um, <laughs> and we have other disabled students to voice their experiences, as well as disabled staff, um, ranging from neurodivergence, physical disabilities, cognition issues, learning disabilities, etc. Um, so part of this was also based on the student impairment policy. So, I mean, I don't know what it's like for you guys, and I would love to hear about it later, but uh, reasonable accommodation as a phrase is a huge gray area. Um, so what one of the leaders of accessibility services, so, so our disability services did, was created a student impairment policy that clearly outlined what a disability was, uh, what a reasonable accommodation actually is, uh, and the obligations of both students and staff, so that if anything happened that a student or staff wasn't happy with, they could complain using said policy. So it created a direct channel for disabled students and disabled staff to actually have their voice heard, rather than going in a big roundabout circle. Um, I was lucky enough to work on that. Um, we are working to ensure disabled student voices are heard at the student union on campus, which currently involves a lot of yelling and a lot of emails that are never responded to and are considered. Um, and we work on building a strong relationship between students and accessibility services. So one of the things I do as president and as somebody on the DAP is I refer uh, students who are afraid to speak to accessibility services themselves um, directly to people who would be able to handle their trauma with a little bit more kindness and a little bit more tact. I'm also a disability advocate on campus because everybody knows I can yell. No. <laughs> so I'll pass it back to you. So our current projects that we've been working on this year is the um, 2023 Disabled Student Network Design. Uh, that was very, very cool. The NZQA redesign of the Quality Assurance Framework for the Non-University Tertiary Education. Um, the Tertiary Education Commission Student and Learner Advisory Committee, CUSPAC, and Make It All for Election Campaign. So much like you guys, we're having the referendum tomorrow. Our general election is tomorrow. Um, yeah. If you're from New Zealand, go vote. <laughs> um, and then our other current projects is the Ministry of Education Curriculum Refresh, which I'm part of, which is very, very cool. Um, the Tipu King and Disabled Student Learner Network, which is very cool to have Sean, Sean part of and some of our uh, members from across the Motu. So we also went to the Pacific Disability uh, conference at the start of the year, which was very beneficial for us, and Sean got on the Pacific Disability Forum. Um, and then we had the Aotearoa 2023 Conference of Pacific Education Ministers, which was um, the inaugural conference, and myself and Bradley, who is um, from Papua New Guinea and is one of the presidents over there, we spoke on behalf of the NGOs to them, which was very cool. Um, member expansion, so we've been able to adopt other um, associations from around the motu, um, which has been very cool to join in and support their um, goals. Then another thing we're currently looking at is a secondary to tertiary transition. So over in Europe, they are obligated to be part of the Students Association, even through high school. So we don't have that over there, oh, over here. And um, we're looking at the best way and the most typical way to be able to contact our secondary school learners, um, as there are a lot of boundaries over in Australasia for that. 
and then tertiary to workplace internships. So we're partnering with places like Aikaha, which is the Ministry for Disabled People in Aotearoa, um, and making sure that there is good transitions and opportunities for disabled people, especially those who may be chronically ill and need hybrid alternatives. And then our contact, yay! Okay, so this is our little link, a little make sure you, you know, email us and contact us. So that will lead you to our link tree, which um, we have our emails there, our websites, our social media. Um, we're very lucky, Sean and I, to be co-presidents this year that we have our AGM um, early November, which will be welcoming on new exec members, which is very cool. So we can have the summer transition period. Um, and we have a lot of plans for this year, uh, especially because we're doing a lot of these international kind of uh, conferences that we get to meet you guys and build more of a student network um, across the Pacific, which I think is so beneficial. Um, yeah. In the chat, for if anyone has any questions, just put it in the chat box.